Amen. Amen. God bless you for coming. I'll preach as if the whole place is filled. So I want to preach my best. If I prepared very well, I saw God's face in prayer. Amen. And God gave me a word for you. Amen. So get ready for it. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I come from Ghana. And Ghana, the leading pro uh, thing we produce in Ghana is cocoa. When you sow cocoa, sometimes it takes a very long time for it to germinate. But once cocoa is germinates and it bears fruit, it is difficult for anybody to approach it. And that is what, through this church, we are going to do. This church is going to take roots. Amen. Amen. So bear with us and then get yourself ready for what Father God has in store for us. Amen. I'm preaching today on the subject I've titled, The God of All Flesh. Somebody say, The God of All Flesh. The God of All Flesh. So this message is coming to you as an individual first. And then to the church second. Amen. Amen. So it's coming to you as an individual first, and then to the church second. And the scripture is what she just read. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? I want you to say it after me. Behold. Behold. I am the Lord. I am the Lord. The God of all flesh. The God of all flesh. Is there anything? Is there anything? Too hard for me. Too hard for me. Why won't we say it like we mean it? <laughs> Jeremiah chapter 32, verse number 27. Behold, Behold, I am the Lord. I am the Lord. The God of all flesh. God of all flesh. Is that anything? Is that anything? Too hard for me. Too hard for me. Hillary, please come here. I've taught my daughter this song and I want her to sing it. <laughs> Just listen to it attentively. Anytime you remember her singing this song, remember the message God to me brought to you, okay? Behold, I am the Lord. The God of the flesh, is there anything, is there anything too hard for me? Is there anything, anything, anything too hard for me? Is there anything, is there anything too hard for me? Is there anything, anything, anything? Too hard for me. Is there anything? Is there anything too hard for me? Hallelujah. Thank you. Hallelujah. He said, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Now, this came from the Lord Himself. So, anytime I'm in crisis, I sing this song to God. Now, let the children say, okay, I want everybody to hear. After, I will give you guys time to do what you have to do. It said, behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. No talking, okay? <laughs> Is that anything too hard for me? Anytime I'm going through challenges and crises, I call this scripture to God. I spoke to several people this week. And I was expecting 15 people assured me that pastor will come to church today. So I was expecting all of them. But you know, it doesn't matter the things that we go through. Bible says, God told Jeremiah, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? You will begin to appreciate this scripture better when you listen to what God through me want to bring to you. So the moment I start a message, Listen to me from eyeball to eyeball so you really understand. And for your assignments, when you go home, everybody read Jeremiah chapter 32, verses number 1 to the end, so you will understand it better and clearer. Shall we pray? Father, in the name of Jesus, give me utterance, even as I speak forth your word. I take authority and I come against everything that is of the devil. I come against every hindrance and every obstacle. Oh my Father, make me a blessing to somebody today, even as they hear me speak your way. In Jesus' name I pray, Amen. 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 Now, hands up everybody so now you understand. Don't read your Bible anymore, listen to me, please. 
Look at me, close your Bible, everybody, so you will understand what I'm bringing to you. So look at me, eyeball to eyeball, because this message is very, very important to everybody here. God told Jeremiah, as a matter of fact, he asked Jeremiah, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Sometimes you find yourself in a situation, you can't pay your bill, and it looks like you are going to be ejected from your apartment, or you are going to lose your mortgage. If you find yourself in a situation like that, Father God has brought me here to let you understand that behold, He is the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is that anything too hard for Him? Sometimes somebody will let you down so very bad, so very, very bad, and you feel like giving up in life. If you find yourself in a situation like that, Father God has brought me here to let you understand that behold, he is the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is that anything too hard for him? Sometimes a friend you trusted so very much, you get him everything, and the friend stab you at the back. Probably you find yourself in a situation sickness. It's eating into you, and it looks like the doctors are giving up on you. Father God has brought me here to let you understand. From Jeremiah chapter 32, verse number 27. He said, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Job-wise, the money is not coming as you are expecting. Virtually every week you hear this week is going to be different. The week ends and you don't see anything. Father God has brought me here, chair, to let you understand that he said, Behold, he is the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? I want you to say it after me again. Behold, I am the Lord. Behold, I am the Lord. The God of all flesh. The God of all flesh. Is that anything? Is that anything? Too hard for me. Too hard for me. For you to appreciate this, Jeremiah, in Jeremiah chapter 32, right? God asked Jeremiah to go to King Zedekiah and prophesy against King Zedekiah. Because King Zedekiah, the king of Judah, was not living right. Israel had entered into apostasy. Apostasy is that level where the whole nation has turned her back on God. And Father God was not happy because he is the God of Israel. So he asked the prophet Jeremiah to go to Zedekiah with a message. The message is this. Okay, this is the word of the Lord to us, the nation. Because you and the whole nation has turned their back on God, our only savior, this is what God wants you to understand. We are going to enter into 70 years captivity. The king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, is going to conquer us. You will see Nebuchadnezzar face to face, eyeball to eyeball, and he will carry you into Babylon for captivity. That is where you will die. No king wants to hear that. The king was very angry with Jeremiah. This is not in the Bible, what I'm going to say, but that is what tradition tells us. Tradition says there were 400 other false prophets in Israel who told the king that Jeremiah is lying. God will never surrender us to the Babylonians. So the king listened to the 400 false prophets. You know what he did? He arrested Jeremiah and he put Jeremiah in prison. According to the Bible, the prison was in the palace. Somebody said in the palace. In the palace. The prison was in the palace. The, all that Jeremiah did was to speak the word of God. And then he found himself in problem. Has it happened to you before? You did what you believe God asked you to do. You did what is right. And instead of you to have blessings, it is curses. Instead of you to enjoy, it is now sorrow. Jeremiah went and told the king exactly what Father God has asked him to say. But then he ended finding himself in prison. I want you to understand that the fact that you live right, the fact that you do right, the fact that you talk right, the fact that you are a child of God, the fact that you are doing what Father God has asked you to do, does not, does not mean you'll never encounter difficulty and challenges. It happened to Jeremiah. He spoke the word of God, exactly what he heard from God. He thought maybe by doing that, everybody will be happy with him. He thought by doing that, God will bless him. But in a few instances, he found himself in the prison. And that prison was in the palace. He found himself in prison because he prophesied to the king that God says we are going to enter into captivity. 
Babylon is going to conquer us. But then the king rather believed the false prophets, so he imprisoned Jeremiah. Listen to me. While Jeremiah was in prison, Egypt, somebody say Egypt. Egypt conquered the Babylonians in a very short time. So the 400 false prophets went to the king. And they said, King, didn't we tell you that Jeremiah is a false prophet? Jeremiah said, Babylon will conquer us and take us into 70 years' captivity. But as we are talking to you now, the news has it that the Egyptians had conquered Babylon. Jeremiah was in prison, he had it. And he was so worried, he was so disturbed. Because he knew he had rights from God. God didn't tell him it was the Egyptians who conquered Israel. God told him it will be the Babylonians. And as the message came to Jeremiah, the Babylonians had been captured by the Egyptians. So it sounded like Jeremiah was becoming a false prophet. Has it happened to you before? That you did the right thing and then rather things were not working for you. You heard God asking you to be in a church. You thought the church was going to grow. You thought things was going to be so beautiful. But then every day it was going down. God brought me here to let you understand, church, that behold, he is the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is that anything too hard for him? Hallelujah. Listen, while Jeremiah was in prison, something very interesting also happened I want to bring to your attention. God told Jeremiah that your cousin Hanamiel is going to visit you in prison. Your cousin Hanamiel has a piece of property, a land, in a place called Anatof. Anatof was a suburb in Israel. When Hanamiel comes to you, buy that property from Hanamiel. And then, when you buy the property, make sure there will be legal documents backing the property. Listen, backing the purchase. And make sure that you uh, put the legal document in a pot, in an earthly vessel, because it will become profitable after many days. Somebody say, after many days. After many days. Now, listen to me, church. God had told Jeremiah that, prophesied to the king, that we are going to enter into 70 years' captivity. It looks like the prophecy did not come to pass. While Jeremiah was in prison, God again told Jeremiah that your cousin is going to come to you when he can buy a piece of property in Israel from him. Now, which businessman will invest in a country which is going to enter into 70 years captivity? If Jeremiah really go ahead and buy that property, wouldn't it confirm the fact that he's really a false prophet? Because you have said we are going to enter into 70 years captivity. Why then should you buy the property? Are you understanding me? Yeah. Church, let me tell you this before I continue. The things of God, if you want to intellectualize it, you miss God. And the reason why many of us, we are missing God is because we want to use our reasoning to judge God. That's why in Christianity, we don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. Because genuine Christianity defies all reasoning. It defies what the mind tells you. Whereas God asks you to do something, the mind will tell you to do something different. But this morning, I want you to understand, God says he's the God of all flesh, and nothing is too hard, too difficult for him. So everything you hear God asking you to do, go ahead and do it anyway. It may not make sense. It might sound stupid and foolish. People might think you are becoming foolishly foolish and stupidly stupid because of the way you are acting or behaving. But listen to me, if you are going to listen to God, and if you are going to obey God, if you are going to follow what God wants you to do, it will turn things around. Is somebody understanding me? Yes. Now let me continue with the story. So, Hanamiel visited Jeremiah. Then Hanamiel told Jeremiah that, Jeremiah, I have a piece of property in Anatuf, and I want to sell it to you. Jeremiah said, okay. So Jeremiah bought it. According to tradition, this is not in the Bible, Tradition says that when Jeremiah bought that property, Jeremiah did not buy the property in his name, but he bought it in the name of the nation Israel. And then the legal document was put in an earthly vessel. That's what the Bible says. But then the tradition also says that that vessel, that pot, was buried because God had told them it would become profitable after many days. Do you know that immediately Jeremiah finished that transaction with his cousin Hanamiel, in a very short time, about two days' time, it was said 
that Babylon had conquered Egypt. And within the space of four days, Babylon marched into Israel, conquered Israel, and took Israel into captivity. Just to fulfill the prophecy of Jeremiah. Those were the days of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they were all carried into 70 years captivity. Amen. Amen. Now, why am I saying all this? You will understand very soon. So they went into captivity for 70 years. After 70 years, they came back to the island. But you see, when you read Jeremiah chapter 32, verse number 15, the reason why God did that is because verse 15, God told Jeremiah that the reason why I want you to buy the land, get a legal document, because it will become profitable after many days. Verse 15 says, because houses and buildings will be occupied again on this land. People, after several years, will live on this land again. You understand that? 70 years was just a short time, so they came back. And their life continued in Israel. In the midst of that, even Jesus Christ was born. When Jesus Christ was born, life continued. One day in the life of Jesus, Luke chapter 20. Luke, let me read it. Let's turn our Bibles to look, and I'll show you the scripture. Jesus Christ gave a prophecy about Israel. Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. Verse number 21st. This is Jesus speaking. Jesus said, And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the resolution thereof is nigh. Then look at verse 24. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Amen. Amen. Now let me explain so you understand. So we, what we are trying to say is that when Jeremiah gave that prophecy to the king, <coughs> initially nobody believed him. So that Jeremiah was put in prison. But what happened was that Jeremiah was eventually released from prison because the king had no choice. All Israel enter, entered into 70 years captivity. And then they came back from captivity. When they came back from captivity, life continued normal. Jesus Christ was even born. And then Jesus Christ, during his ministry, he saw Jerusalem and he prophesied about Jerusalem. Verse number 20, Luke chapter 24. He said, Jerusalem shall fall by the sword. And then verse 24 says, Jerusalem will, Israel will even scatter. It will cease from becoming a nation. He said, until the fullness of the Gentiles is coming. Do you know that exactly, listen to me, exactly 30 years, after Jesus, I'm sorry, exactly 40 years after Jesus said this, specifically in AD 70, there was this general from Roman called Titus. General Titus led the Roman army, they came to Israel, they conquered Israel, and Israel ceased from becoming a nation on that day to fulfill this scripture Jesus gave. So in AD 70, Israel was destroyed completely from the surface of the earth. There was no nation on earth called Israel again. So they scattered. That's why we have Russian Jews, we have Ethiopian Jews, we have American Jews, we have Jews everywhere to fulfill the scripture. But that was not the end of it. Jesus said, until, until, somebody say until. Until. Let me read it again. Verse number 24, it says, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Let me explain to you what the time of the Gentiles is. The time of the Gentiles is when God decided to save the Gentiles. Jesus actually did not come because of us. When Jesus sent his disciples the first time to go and preach, he told them that never you go to the Gentiles, don't go to the Samaritans, but go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. When the Syrophoenician woman came to Jesus Christ for help, so Jesus Christ will help her, her daughter. She told Jesus, Jesus Christ told her, that woman, I'm not sent, but only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So Jesus did not come for us. He came only because of the Israelites. And in his own wisdom, 
he made the Israelites blind so they wouldn't see him. So they rejected him. So in John chapter 1, verse number 11, he said, I came unto my own, and my own did not receive me. Therefore, verse 12, he says, As many as will receive me, to them have they given them power to become the sons of God. So although he came for his own, according to the book of Isaiah, he made them blind so they wouldn't see. So they will reject him. And when they rejected him, he threw the invitation worldwide. So the fullness of the Gentiles is when the Gentiles also can call themselves children of God. That is when Christianity started. The fullness of the Gentiles is the Gentile. See, in the Bible days, a Gentile is somebody who is not a Jew. But Jesus came for the Jews. And then when the Jews did not receive him, he invited the Gentiles. So the fullness of the Gentiles is when Gentiles can also call themselves children of God. Are you understanding me? So in Romans chapter 9, verse number 20 says, Bible, Paul took his time and explained that God rejected the Jews. As a matter of fact, Paul called them the natural branches. And we, the Gentiles, we are called artificial branches. So the natural branches were rejected. So the artificial branches will be drafted in. And Bible says, until after the artificial branches, when the artificial branches are drafted in, God will go back and save the, the Israelites again. Remember, they are God's people. The difference between us and the Jews is this. We all have covenant with God, so we'll make it to heaven. The covenant that the church has with God is through Jesus Christ. The covenant that the Jews have with God is through the Abrahamic covenant. So all Jews, according to Romans, will be saved. Their salvation, as a matter of fact, has nothing to do with us. It's different from our salvation. For us to get saved, we need to receive Jesus as our personal savior. A Jew may get saved without necessarily receiving Jesus as his or her personal savior. But when a Jew receives Jesus as his or her personal savior, that is bonus for them. They will get saved during the Great Tribulation, I will explain later. But Jews, whether they receive Christ or not, they will make it to heaven. But when they receive Jesus now, they will rapture with us. So they don't have to go through the Great Tribulation. During the Great Tribulation, after the church is gone, then God in his own infinite wisdom will save them again. But what I'm trying to say here is this. Listen. Jesus Christ prophesied that Israel will scatter as a nation and it happened in AD 70. So in AD 70, Israel stopped from becoming a nation. But the interesting thing is this. During the Second World War, right, Adolf Hitler, that German leader, he massacred six million Jews that's what we call the Holocaust. Six million. His intention was to eradicate Israel completely from the surface of the earth. So the international community had compassion for the Jews. So led by the United States of America, they decided to help the Jews regroup. And then they realized that in the Bible days, so many years ago, they were living in the Middle East. But by that time, that place had been conquered, had been taken by the Arabs. Who are the Arabs? Remember Abraham had as many as eight children. Many of us, we think Abraham had only two children. But he had eight. But you know, his first son is called Ishmael. And Ishmael had the Ishmaelites who later became the Arabs. And that is where they had lived since time in Memoria. So, the Arabs also have covenant with Abraham. Remember when Hagar, when Hagar was running from the house because Sarah didn't want her to live there. And she got to a place, the child was thirsty, Ishmael was thirsty. So Hagar was praying that God help us, I don't want my son to die. And the angel of God appeared, and the angel said, I have heard the voice of the Lord. It was Hagar who was praying. But then the angel said, I've heard the voice of the child. Because the child has covenant with God through Abraham. The child was Abraham's seed. You understand that? Yes. But then, God did not recognize them in pertaining to the blessing that has to do with redemption. So in Genesis chapter 22, God told Abraham, take your son, your only son, Isaac. By that time, Ishmael was, Isaac was a young child. By then, Ishmael was 13 years older than Isaac. But then God said, your only son, Isaac, had indication that God recognized Ishmael as a bastard because Abraham seriously disobeyed God. On our Wednesday service, we will throw more light on this so we will understand. But what I want to let you understand here is this. 
when the international community was trying to help Israel to go and live in the Middle East, all that place had been taken by the Arabs. As a matter of fact, even the temple Solomon built, it was destroyed. And the Arabs had built their temple there. It was built in AD 622. So the Arabs were living there. And things had become very difficult for the Jews. They didn't know what to do. So the international community compensated the Palestinians and they gave the Israelis a portion of land to live there. By the power of God, supported by the United States of America, Israel became slowly but surely more powerful. They started taking the lands from the Palestinians. The Arabs did not like it. So they all came together and they were always fighting the Israelis. Always fighting. Do you know that the case was taken to the International Court of Justice at the Hague in Holland? Listen to me so you understand. The case was taken to the International Court of Justice at the Hague in Holland. Now, the Israelis were basing the argument from the Bible. They claimed that that is where they were living since time in memorial, even before they were destroyed in AD 70. The Arabs were also saying that that is where we have lived all along. So they can't take the land from us. It was only after 1948 when the international community tried to help them. That's when they came to live there. There was always contention between these two people. The Israelis wanted to base the argument from the scroll, what we call the Bible today. The judge who sat on the case said the scroll is a religious book. It does not hold in court. Should everybody base their argument from their religious book, whom are we going to believe? So it looks like always there was fighting, contention, misunderstanding. Listen to me, in 1967, according to history, the, Palest the Israelis were celebrating one of their festivals. And it is said that the Spirit of God came so powerfully upon them, the archaeologists among them started to take the ground. Later, they even said they didn't know why they started digging the ground. As they kept on digging, they discovered the pots. When they found the port, they saw a document in it. Listen. When that document was brought, they realized that, you know, the language had even been distorted. They couldn't read. Do you know that the Hebrew language was spoken in Jeremiah's time? But when they came from captivity, they were not speaking Hebrew. The Hebrew language had completely disappeared. Jesus' time, there was nothing like Hebrew. Jesus speak, spoke Aramaic. His time, he was preaching in Aramaic. That's why the... The Old Testament was written in Hebrew, but the New Testament was written partly in Aramaic and partly in Greek. So even in Jesus' time, the Hebrew language is lost. But then the language started coming up again. It's actually one of the signs of the last days. In the book of Zechariah, the Bible says in the last days, God will restore the pure language again. And that is the Hebrew language. That is the only language which can be described as pure. You know why? It is the only language without a curse in it. So for example, if a Jew is angry with somebody, I want to curse the person, he has to speak a different language to curse the person. Because the Hebrew language, there is no curse in it. That's why it's called the pure language. The Bible says, in the last days, God is going to restore the pure language. So what happened is, when they went back to the Middle East, through the help of linguistics, they were able to restore the Hebrew language. So that document which they found, they realized the language had been distorted a little. So it was taken to the School of Linguistics. And to their surprise, they realized that that document they discovered was so many years ago document, which Jeremiah bought the nation, a part of the nation of Israel, not in his name, but in the name of the nation. Are you understanding me? So they went to court again. This time, their proof was not going to come from the scroll or the Bible, but their proof was going to come from a legal document proving that the land is theirs. Because what we quoted from Jeremiah chapter 32, God told Jeremiah to buy the document from Hanamiel, put it in an earthen vessel, because it is going to become profitable after many days. Somebody say after many days. After many days. So when they went to court this time, for the first time in the history of Israel in 1967, the International Court of Justice ruled that Israel can now become a sovereign state the land is this. The Arabs were not happy, so they came together, they fought to fight the Israel. And as they kept on fighting, that's when Israel was able to get the Golan High from the Syrians. They had the King David Abbey from the Egyptians. They widened even their, their horizon, and they became big and more powerful. But why am I saying all this? 
You got to understand that Jeremiah did what is what doesn't make sense. He was in prison. He didn't do anything wrong. He prophesied to the king that God says we are going to enter into captivity. And the king put him in prison for saying that. And then there were other 400 false prophets who told the king that Jeremiah is a false prophet. Don't listen to him. And even when Jeremiah was in prison, Jeremiah had said, Babylon will conquer us. But whilst he was in prison, Egypt conquered Babylon. And then as he was confused, he didn't know what to do. God asked him to buy that document. Not in his name, in the name of the nation Israel. That's why I asked you which businessman will invest in a country which is going to enter into 70 years captivity. Sometimes, church, God will ask you to do something that will blow your mind. You can go to a church where you have so many people, the place is filled up already. But if you understand destiny, if you understand posterity, you wouldn't mind the number of people here. You always want to come around. If you understand that whatever you do or whatever you don't do is linked to the generation yet unborn, you will never allow anything to discourage you. Sometimes, church, God will ask you to do something that will not make sense. And that is why many people are missing God, because severally, we want to intellectualize God. We want to reason with God. The Bible says that wisdom of God is foolishness to this world. So if you want to use your mind to calculate God, you miss him. If you want to use your mind to check God out, to size God out, you miss him. But then if you obediently follow him and follow exactly what he has asked you to do, it will go a long way not only to bless you alone, but it will bless your family, it will bless people around you, it will even bless the generation yet of God. Imagine Jeremiah had not done that. Imagine Jeremiah said, God, I'm tired, I'm fed up. I will even buy the document from my cousin Hanamiel when he visits me. What was going to be the fate of Israel? Church, your obedience to God or your disobedience to God is never personal. And I'll never get tired of saying this until it sink into the center of our heart. Each one of us, whatever you do or whatever you don't do will affect somebody else. When we understand this, we'll be very careful in the places that we go. When we understand this, when you are thinking of you being relocated to a different state, you consider it prayerfully. When you understand this, when you are going to get married to somebody, you consider it prayerfully. Because it may not make sense. But it is linked to so many people. And what Jeremiah did, changed Israel completely. Gave Israel hope once again. Severally, they will return from the International Court of Justice and their head will be bowed down. Because the land Father God gave to them, because of Abraham's mistake, we will discuss this. Abraham carelessly listened to his wife instead of listening to God. And then he slept with his maid servants. And then they had Ishmael. If you're a very good student of the Bible, you'll know that the very day Abraham slept with that woman, God never spoke to Abraham. God removed himself completely from Abraham. As a matter of fact, Abraham was 86 years old. 86 years old. Let's go to Genesis. I'll show it to you. Let's turn to Genesis. Genesis chapter 16, the last two verses in the end, and then we'll combine it with chapter 17, verse number 1. If you don't have a Bible, just listen to me as I read. Genesis chapter 16, last two verses. I told you the other time that the original Bible we call the scroll. We had no chapters, we had no verses. It was Stephen Latin who divided the entire Bible into chapters. In 1441. And then Aaron Nathan divided only the Old Testament into chapters in 1551. And in 1664, seven. Something I've forgotten. Seven something. He divided the New Testament also into verses. Before then, we had no chapters, we had no verses. So sometimes you enjoy it more when you forget about the chapters and verses. And that's what I want to do now. So look at Genesis chapter 16. We are reading from verse 15 and 16. And they'll move to 17 verse 1. So we are removing the chapter as if it is a... So let me read all the three together. It says, And Hagar bare Abraham a son. And Abraham called his son's name, which Hagar bore, Ishmael. And Abraham was four score and six years old. That is 86 years old. When Hagar bore 
Ishmael to Abraham. So now 17 verse 1. And when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said unto him, I am Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Amen. So when Abraham was 86 years old, he had Ishmael. The next time we heard from Abraham again was when he was 99 years old. That 13 years speaks a lot of volume. And God intentionally brought those years to teach us something. So for 13 years, 13 years, there was no communication between Father God and Abraham. Because Abraham had done an abominable thing, something that was going to distort God's calendar for human beings forever. So when Abraham was 99 years old, God appeared to him and said, Abraham, I am Almighty God. The original Hebrew version says, I am your El Shaddai. Somebody say El Shaddai. El Shaddai, El Shaddai comes from two Hebrew words joined together. El and then Shaddai. El means great, mighty, awesome, big, terrible, and Shaddai being breast. So God is telling Abraham that Abraham, I have the biggest, the largest, the dependable breasts. So feed on my breast so you become perfect. What is the breast of God? First Peter 2, 2, 2, 1. It says, as newborn babies, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. So the wine of God is the milk of God. You know how children, when we want them to grow very well, we feed them with the breast milk. So the breast milk of God is the word of God. You understand that? Yes. So God was telling Abraham that, Abraham, I have the most dependable food. I have the most reliable food. I will depend on my food. Because Abraham had depended on something else. A wife from his wife. And then he slept with Ishmael. He slept with Hagar. He had Ishmael. The birth of Ishmael was going to actually affect God's people. When God told Israel that I'm giving you the land flowing with milk and honey, as a matter of fact, it is the oil flowing in the Middle East. But because of Abraham's mistake, now Israel don't have a single oil. All the oil is in the hands of the Arabs. I believe Abraham would know the said in heaven and say, Father God, I made a mistake. And that is why Father God never recognized Ishmael, Ishmael as Abraham's son. When Ishmael was about 13 years old, he was playing with Isaac and he was beating Isaac. And God didn't like it. Sorry, Sarah didn't like it. So Sarah became angry and Sarah told Abraham, that Abraham, kick Hagar and son from the house. Abraham said, why should I do that? She was my maid servant, but now she is my concubine. And she has given us a child. When Abraham went to sleep, God told Abraham, listen to your wife and kick them out. So Abraham did. You understand that? Again, in Genesis chapter 22, when God wanted Abraham to offer Isaac for a sacrifice, God specifically said, Abraham, take Isaac, your son, your only child. An indication that God did not recognize Ishmael. So, here what I'm trying to say is that when Abraham did that thing, sleeping with Hagar and Ishmael was born, now check this out. Do you know that out of the Arabs, we had Saddam Hussein, who used chemical weapons to spray on his own people? What a man. Haven't you noticed how the Muslims are becoming a menace to society? When a one of them become converted, they have to kill that person. Look at Nigeria. How they are killing somebody who put bomb on himself and kill several people. Which human being in his right mind would do that? Look at the way Osama bin Laden trained people and then they nearly brought the world to a standstill with September 11th. All these were the product of Abraham's action. Are you understanding me? Yes. Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 36. It says, for you have need of patience. Can you say that after me? For you have need of patience. Need of patience. For you have need of patience. For you have need of patience. So that after you have done the will of God. So that after you have done the will of God. You may receive the promise. Yes. This is what Father Abraham didn't know. So although God had told him, I'm going to make you father of many nations, he had waited eight. He had waited for how many years? Eleven more years. And no child is coming. So he listened to his wife when he was 86 years and slept with his maid servant. But then when he was 99 years, God appeared to him and said, Abraham, if you want to be perfect, feed on my breast. In other words, feed on my word. Let my word become the determined factor in everything that you do. Don't listen to the word from anybody else. You listen to your wife and look at the harm it's going to cause humanity in future. 
Abraham, listen to your wife alone, listen to my word alone, feed on my word alone. That is why El Shaddai means God our source of supply, or God our sufficiency, or God who is more than enough. What it means is that the breast of God, the word of God, is enough for us. Apart from this, you don't need any other thing. This alone, if you plan your life on this alone, it can turn your life around. Hallelujah. And that is what will make us perfect. So it doesn't matter the situation you find yourself, church. Sometimes situation might let you go and do something crazy. And eventually you will, you will regret. Sometimes if you are not careful, your financial challenges or your financial crisis will let you do something that you will regret later. But today, the word of God for us is this. I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Things that may not be going the way you are expecting. But hey, don't go ahead of God. Abraham did, and look at the mess. Amen. Amen. Still, stay put and wait on the Lord. Bible says, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he will strengthen your heart. Bible says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not even faint. So let us learn to wait on the Lord. When you do all that you know how, and things are not working, stay put. Keep on confessing positive. I tell people faith is a tender plant. It grows in the atmosphere of confession. Keep on com confessing positive whilst you are waiting. Never you allow any negative thought to set in and still depend on God. And at the right time, he will show forth. He told Jeremiah when he was in prison, Behold, I am the Lord. Hillary, come and sing the song once again. <laughs> Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Let's see it for the last time. Behold, Behold. Behold. I am the Lord. I am the Lord. The God of all flesh. God of all flesh. Is there anything? Is there anything? Too hard for me. So the passage for today, the Bible theme for today is the God of all flesh. And we heard it from Jeremiah chapter 32, verse number 27. God says, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Is in his hands. He can do whatever he wants to do. He can turn the clock anyhow. Nebuchadnezzar, the unbelieving king, said, He set forth one, he appoints one and demotes the other. This is the God we serve. So let's have confidence and hope in him, knowing that whatever you do today, it has eternal consequence. Not only in the world to come, but even on this earth as well. Joel Austin is pastoring a church of 50,000 people and he's happy. But his father has laid solid foundation. His father went through so many challenges. His father was in the church. They sacked the father. Because they thought the father was crazy. Mm -hmm. Because the father was talking about Holy Ghost baptism and born again and salvation and speaking in tongues and praying loud. And they said, no, we don't believe in this. So they sacked him. And he went to start a new church. Then I heard Joel Austin. He said his father... When things were working for his father, the church was doing well. And the father was happily married with four children. The wife divorced him. And then the father became so worried. He said, what a crime. Man, a man of God, my wife has divorced me. What will I tell people? He thought of giving up. He thought, of, he thought his world was coming to an end. But what he did is he encouraged himself and he married again. When he married again, out of the second marriage, Joel Austin and the others were born. And now then, out of that second marriage, he has a child who pastors over 50,000 people. I'm sure the father, wherever he is now, will say, wow, Father God, I thank you for not letting me give up. Do you know in that situation, he could have committed suicide to end it all? 
Several people think of committing suicide, so they abort their mission, they abort their dreams. Hey, don't let anything let you stop what you are doing. Sometimes you might think of quitting. I understand that winners don't quit and quitters don't win. Amen. Amen. I understand that people are waiting to tap from the challenges you are going through today. The foundation you are laying in this church is going to have eternal consequence. Come two years time, five years time. If you understand what I'm sharing with you now, some of you begin to give more so we'll be able to pay our bills without difficulty. If you understand what I'm sharing with you today, some of you come to church always knowing that your presence will encourage somebody. If you understand what I'm sharing today, some of you will take a deliberate effort to see God's face in fasting and prayer for this church. You lay food aside so that things will turn around. If you understand what I'm sharing today, some of you will begin to look for people and bring them to church. How many places will you hear some of the things we share? The words we share here, they are good. They are deep. Amen. And that's why you got to get involved. Today, God is challenging you. Let's have our eyes closed, please. Maybe you heard me talk and you are not even a Christian. You are not a Christian.